Hey, all right. Welcome to another exciting edition of Model Building Start to Finish. This is John. I'm sitting with Dan here, and we're looking at this SD40 that's been having work done to it for well over a year now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think last time you said something about maybe doing some painting soon, huh? Right. That's exactly um, what we're going to do, and we're going to start that process right now. So uh, the first thing that needs to happen is that all the parts need to be washed. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah, and that's to remove any residual skin oils or plastic dust or anything else that's on the model that would interfere with the painting process. All right, well, let's take a look at it. Okay, so for larger parts, what I do is I go to the sink and I spray them with some Windex and then rinse them off. Okay. So this is the parts like the shell, the nose, side frames, anything that I can hold in my hand easily and hopefully not drop down the drain. Yeah, that would suck. Yeah. Do you have a little thing that you put in the drain so in case that uh, happens? Like I a little didn't, mesh? actually, but that's not a bad idea. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do have some good ideas once in a while, Dan. Yeah. What about the stuff that had putty on it? Doesn't putty get affected by that, or does it no. not? No, the putty won't be affected. It's already dry. Um, it's not water-soluble either. Okay. Um, also, I wanted to point out that, as you can see, I'm wearing gloves. And I do that for two reasons. One is because I have kind of sensitive skin, and sometimes uh, soaps and things irritate my skin. Yeah. So that's one reason. And the other thing is to keep from putting new fingerprints on the model as I'm washing it. I'm right, trying to get the fingerprints off. Right, because you always have oil in your, in your skin. So. Right. Yeah. So the idea is once the model's washed, I'm going to set it on a paper towel, and then I'm going to let it air dry. So, yeah, I'm really curious about the small parts. How, how are you going to... Yeah, now these are a little different, and as you can see, I've already put a lot of these on some blue tape so that I can hold them more easily while I'm painting. These don't really lend themselves to being run under the faucet. So what I'm doing here is I have a micro brush, and I dip the micro brush in some rubbing alcohol, and I'm just rubbing the alcohol over the parts. So it's, it's almost like painting it with alcohol, but you're scrubbing off right. oils and, and stuff. And the alcohol will evaporate very quickly, so you don't need to worry about um, leaving a residue or anything like that. Yeah. Something else I noticed is that by putting the pieces on tape, it helps with the cleaning process too, doesn't it? Right, because it holds them steady. And I also don't have to touch the parts. Again, I'm still wearing gloves, but you know, the less you handle the stuff from this point on, the better. Okay, so for the chassis, again... Not a good idea to run it under the faucet because <laughs> it's got an electric motor and electric motors and water usually aren't a good combination. Even if it's a can motor, you don't want to do that. Especially, yeah, well, it's, right. it's not sealed, I don't think. Um, so what I'm doing here is, again, uh, with some alcohol, I'm swabbing the wheel faces and I'm also going to swab the fuel tank. Oh, right. Yeah, because you did a lot of work on the fuel tank, so it probably got a lot of fingerprints on it. Right. So I want to get all of that off. I didn't realize that painting is so fussy like but i guess if it's gonna look good and go on yeah, evenly you know, and painting is about 95 percent prep work yeah it is for painting houses too i yeah. remember that the actual shooting the paint part is not the time consuming part once i've washed the chassis i'll take the tape off the motor to release the wires and then i'm going to take the trucks off because I want to work on the trucks separately from the chassis. Okay, well, 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 why, why are you going to release? Oh, because the trucks are attached? I don't get it. What? Well, the wires are, are soldered to the trucks, so I have to loosen all the wires before I start pulling things apart. Just they to were... get distance from the chassis? or Well, what? because those wires were taped to the motor. Oh, I see what you did. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so on the handrails, there's a little possibility that there might be some residual soldering flux left on them. So what I'm doing is I'm taking my motor tool with a wire brush attachment and very, very gently scouring the stanchions. But yeah, I mean, couldn't they fall off if the soldering is not... That's why I said very carefully. If you notice, I'm, I'm putting my finger directly behind the stanchion that I'm working on to support it yeah. so that I'm not doing it in midair because you, you, you really don't want to break your... it at this point. Yeah. Um, I could see how that would happen too. Yeah. I'd be worried, though, with the wire brush, if your finger's that close to it, that you'd hit it. Is it well, pretty easy? Well, those to... gloves that I have are, are like uh, industrial strength gloves. They're pretty thick. They're thicker than the average, like, hospital gloves. Yeah. So, um, and as long as you're not really pressing it that hard, it's not going to burn through it. This is also a really good time to check the handrails over, and if there's any little tiny soldering 
blobs or anything that need to be removed, it's a good time to take a little file and just get rid of those before paint goes on. So it's really fine tuning and cleaning up all your little joints and all that? Right. Instead of alcohol, I'm using white vinegar. Okay, and what's the Because white reason? vinegar has a little bit of an acidic uh, property, so it will... Um, cleans off the metal, right? Cleans off the metal, yeah. yeah. So what I'm doing is I, I poured some in a, in a pan, and I'm just putting all the handrails in it, and I'm going to let them soak for a while. How long do you soak them? A few minutes is probably enough. Okay, so once I've let the parts soak in vinegar, then I'll run them under the faucet and rinse them off. It looks like you're using some Windex too, huh? Yeah, just a little bit just to make sure they're really clean. And then, I, again, I'll put them on a paper towel, clean paper towel, and just let them dry overnight. After this thing is dried overnight and I've taken everything apart, it's ready to be painted. So the first step is to spray some primer on it. So I've got my spray booth set up, and I'm using some Tamiya Fine Surface Primer. It comes in white and gray. I'm using the white. And this is actually a rattle can primer, but it's very good quality and it goes on very smooth, almost as if you'd airbrushed it. And it's a lot more convenient than having to fire up the airbrush and then clean the airbrush just to apply some primer. And I'm starting here with the chassis. And I don't need to worry so much about complete coverage on the chassis since it's going to be black, but I think using some primer helps the paint adhesion. As I'm applying a second coat to the chassis, I wanted to point out that I taped off the motor and the wires so that I wouldn't get any paint on that stuff. Yeah, if you get paint on the wires, it might confuse you when you're trying to hook everything back up. <laughs> right. Uh, and everything's would, white, Dan. Yeah, no, don't need that. When I'm priming the shell, um, it's really important to put on nice thin coats. Don't try to cover it all at once. Um, so I'm going to end up doing several coats on the shell. Now, when you're using a color like yellow, like on the Santa Fe, you must use a primer. It's not a suggestion. You have to. Otherwise, the yellow will look terrible. <laughs> I think I've seen some models we reviewed where they didn't use good primer. Yeah. Now that the first coat is dry, I notice that there's some uh, little blobs of something on some of the hood doors. So I'm taking some 600 grit paper and sanding them off. Oh, right. It's better to get blobs off now because blobs being painted just get bigger, don't they? Right. And you don't want to have ugly lumps on the finished job. <laughs> you know. It sounds like a disease. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm doing the side frames and I'm just holding them by the little prongs in the back where they mount onto the trucks. Right, the part you push in. Right, those yeah. that part doesn't have to get painted. And again, these are going to be silver, so the primer is not so critical, but I'm using some anyway. So sometimes for small parts, I find it convenient to use a pair of sprung tweezers to hold them. What is this part? This is the snow plow. So the nose I've found um, actually fits on my thumb. <laughs> so I just stick it there, and then I can rotate it around without dropping it. Do what works. Yeah. And again, this is one of those parts where you have to prime it in stages, so thin coats. So I'm spraying some of the parts that I stuck on the tape and oh, just right. basically holding the tape and also some of the parts that are still on the sprue. Yeah, I remember you left some on during right. the, the process and saying you would paint them later. Right. Okay, so for the handrails, especially the this long rear handrails, um, there isn't really a convenient place to hold them. So I'm going to prime them in several steps, and I just basically grab one of the stanchions and hold it. Obviously, that one's not going to get painted this time around, so it'll have to wait till the next pass. Oh, so you're just going to hold them by a different stanchion each time? Right. I'll use a pair of sprung tweezers to hold some of the small handrails while I'm painting them. So here I have the nose, and I'm giving it another coat. Uh, I'm going to continue to put coats of paint on the nose and the yellow areas of the shell until it's solid white. So for the horn conduit on the roof, again, I'm just going to have to spray this in sections because I can't hold it and spray all of it at the same time. I changed the way I decided to do the ditch lights a little bit. I originally said I was going to put a piece of fiber optic into the hole to keep the paint out, but then I realized I wanted to keep the reflector. So what I did is I cut small pieces of blue tape instead with a tiny punch that I have that makes little circles. Oh, and then you just stuck that into the holes? Right. So I'm just giving one final coat on the shell just to make sure that all the yellow areas really are solid white. And how many coats did you end up using? Oh, three or four. Again, put it on very lightly. Let it build up. Don't try to, you know, put all the paint on at once because it'll be a, not a very good paint job. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I used to try to paint model planes and stuff, and it gets that sort of running effect. Yeah, you don't, like, want the, you don't want to put awful. so much paint on that it starts to get liquid and run all over the place. 
So you might notice, uh, I don't know how well it shows up here, but um, the area like around the dynamic brake fans, you can still see a little black through there, but that's going to be dark blue, so it really doesn't matter. It's not going to show. Doesn't matter as much, huh? Right. It's the ends of the model, the cab, and the sills that are going to be yellow, and that stuff absolutely has to be pure white. Hey, if you have any leftover paint, you can go out tagging. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm going to start spraying color on the interior, the cab interior. And I'm starting with some Model Master enamel, and I have two colors. One is Sublime Green, and the other is Insignia White. So right now, I'm mixing the Sublime Green because it's been sitting for a long time. So I, I have an old file, and I'm using the handle of the file as a paint stirrer, and I'm just mixing it up. I like to wrap a little piece of paper towel around the bottles before I pour them to keep it from making too much of a mess. Oh, you get that drip down the side otherwise, huh? Right. So I, what I'm doing here is I'm pouring paint into the bottle that goes on the airbrush. And I'm actually going to have to mix a color because this green is way too vibrant for the inside of the engine. So I'm going to uh, mix some of that Insignia White with it and tone it down. I don't know why they paint the inside of the locomotives that awful green but <laughs> <laughs> it's like let's make the most ugly color of green we can and we'll use that on the inside of the engine <laughs> exactly yeah should again have been, should have been tan <laughs> yeah i'm having to mix this paint up because it's separated and the, usually what happens with this paint is the uh, thinner rises to the top and the pigment settles to the bottom yeah just like most paint yeah but like I said before, old files make really good paint stirrers. Yeah, because they're thin, right? Yeah, and I'm using the, I'm holding the file by the, the file end and, and sticking the handle, actually, into the jar because it's smoother and I can wipe it off. So, again, I'm wrapping a towel around the bottle. How do you know how much? Oh, it looks like you're putting a lot in there. I did. I wanted to uh, lighten it. Now, I do, you know, this is the inside of an engine, and to be honest, I don't have... a any shots of the inside of this engine specifically. So I'm just adding white until it looks right to my eye. Well, and to be honest, right, you're not you're probably never going to see the inside of the engine anyway. So exactly. it just has to I, be somewhat representative. I'm not too concerned about this because it's going to be inside that dark cab. It's going to be very, barely visible. And so it doesn't really matter too much. Right. And behind plastic windows too. Right. So. <laughs> so the paint as it comes out of the bottle is too thick. So I need to add some paint thinner. Right. And I do that with an eyedropper. The way to tell when it's thin enough is to take the end of the file and run it up the side of the jar. And if the paint leaves an even uh, streak in terms of the width of the streak that runs down the jar, it's probably about right. So how did you figure this out just over the years of doing this? Or? Yeah, and this is what I've been told. And actually, it's, it's better. I, I've read stuff about this, too. But it, you're actually better to have a little bit too thin than too thick, because if the paint is too thick, it'll get that orange peel effect. Uh-huh. So now I've loaded my green mixture into my airbrush, and I'm spraying the parts. And I'm just giving them several light coats until it looks right to me. Those light coats tend to dry almost instantly, don't they? That's the idea, yeah. So it's really important to make sure to clean up the airbrush after every use. Right. Um, so what I do if I'm not going to save the paint, and I only save paint if I'm going to use it sometime soon because I, I've found that if I try to save paint for long periods, it ends up being a congealed blob of junk anyway, and I end up throwing it out. So what I'm doing is I'm soaking up the paint on pieces of paper toweling and then putting it in the garbage. Oh, yuck. Uh, Speaking yeah. of blobs of garbage, look at that. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, you don't want to pour paint down the sink or something. So if it's, if it's on a paper towel, it'll dry, and it'll just be solid, you know, and then it won't be such an environmental hazard. Now I'm just using some plain old lacquer thinner and putting it in there. And once I get the jar mostly clean, then I'll use some thinner to clean it out. So now I'm just wiping the jar out with a clean paper towel and getting most of the paint out of it. Yeah, it almost seems like you could just put a lid on it and shake it or something. So it's the jar itself is mostly clean at this point. But I'm going to add some more lacquer thinner. But don't you want to spray some through the airbrush too? Yeah, so now I'm putting the lid on so I can spray some of this through the airbrush. Okay, so I went back to the spray booth and uh, just sprayed some of that 
thinner through the airbrush, and that helps to clean the airbrush. And now I'm going to wipe the jar completely clean. I used to joke about making flamethrowers. This probably <laughs> would work, huh? Probably. I'm sure lacquer thinner burns. I haven't ever tried it, but... Uh, yeah, don't. Yeah. It's probably very dangerous. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. Again, I'm just soaking it up on pieces of paper towel and then putting it in the garbage. Okay, so I have a Badger 155 airbrush, and one of the things I like about it is that it disassembles really easily. This is what they call an internal mix airbrush. Some people claim they're harder to use than the external mix kind, but I find this one pretty easy. And I like it because it's fairly easy to clean. Uh, I disassembled it part way, and then I loosened the back so I can shove the needle forward. And then I can wipe the needle off with some thinner on a paper towel. Seems like you could have used the thinner you soaked out of the bottle if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, I could have. I could have if I'd wanted, wanted to do that. It looks like a tattoo gun, Dan. <laughs> Did you give yourself a tattoo while you were doing this? No, I didn't. So then I'm putting it back together. And one of the things you want to be careful of is that the needle has a really sharp tip. You want to make sure not to mess that up because if the little tip gets bent, then it'll spray kind of crooked. And that, that isn't so good. So you want to make sure to be really careful when putting it back together. So see, now I'm, I'm testing the trigger to make sure that the trigger snaps back and forth real easily. If it sticks, then the airbrush is still dirty. So now I've moved on to a different paint. This is Model Master Engine Black Flat Acrylic. Now for acrylic paint, I use a different jar uh, because acrylic is water-based and I don't want any water to mix with my solvent-based paints. Yeah, that would mess it up. Right. So it's a good idea to use separate, um, at least on the same day until the jars have had a chance to completely dry out, to use different jars uh, when spraying. So this, this little airbrush jar is not the same one we just saw. So I'm pouring some of this paint into the airbrush jar. So the process really is the same, huh? Pretty much, yeah. The only difference is you use different thinners and things. Would you cut this with water? Um, no, actually, I use Windex. Okay, for, that was my um, second guess. Yeah, um, water has too much surface tension, and it tends to make really big droplets, and it doesn't work very well. Um, Windex works well, or uh, sometimes even alcohol can work. Yeah. So now I'm ready to spray some black. Now I'm moving on and going to spray some silver on the side frames. And here I have a jar of uh, Scale Coat 2 silver. Is this acrylic too? No, this is a solvent-based paint. And actually, Scale Coat is one of my favorite paints. Um, I really like it. Um, but again, this paint does tend to separate when it's been stored. So I have to stir up the jar quite a bit before I use it. I think I all paint, it. paint does that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So now I've got my airbrush jar... And I'm going to pour some of the silver into it. Is this yet another airbrush bottle? Uh, this is the same bottle that I used for the green. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a set, not the, like I said, I use a different uh, jar for acrylic and a different jar for solvent-based paints. So um, just to make sure there's no moisture getting into the solvent-based paint. And for this, I'm thinning it with the Scale Coat 2 thinner. Scale Coat 2. Yeah, there's Scale Coat 1 and Scale Coat 2. Um, supposedly Scale Coat 2 is, I think, plastic safe. Hmm. Although I've found that if you spray thin coats, it doesn't really make any difference. Well, we'll use what, should use what you're supposed to use, right? I mean, yeah. this is a how-to, so. Yeah. And again, I'm using a different eyedropper to put the thinner into the paint jar and then stir it. And again, do that test to try to see, you know, that nice even line running down the side of the jar. So that, that part of the process never changes then, does it? No, you want basically the same consistency of paint. So it, it's actually fairly thin. It's kind of like milk or something. Not, not a real thick consistency. Again, I'm holding the side frames by the little prongs in the back that stick into the truck on the model to mount them. That's a nice safe place to hold them. And I'm just spraying each one individually with silver. And again, trying to hit them from a bunch of different angles to make sure that there's no bare spots. Silver is another color that generally covers really easily. So um, it doesn't take a whole lot of paint to paint these things. Yeah, I can see where you'd have to go on different angles, though, because you have these little brass wires going across the thing. And the last thing you want to do is have a streak of that that's not covered. Right, right. Uh, you look really bad. Right. So 
Um, you don't really need to worry about the back of it too much because that isn't going to be seen. Although I am hitting the, the back in, in certain spots like on the bottom just to make sure that nothing shows through there. This is the chassis after it's had a chance to dry. And I've also, even though it was already flat black, I sprayed it with a coat of dull coat just out of the can. Right. Just to uh, make sure it was flat. <laughs> well, um, it's like flat, flat now. Yeah. So I can go ahead and take the tape off now. This is kind of like a moment of truth here, right? Like you're going to see if you've... Yeah, hopefully we haven't painted the motor. <laughs> that would truly suck. Yeah, well, I mean, it would still work. It's just, it's not necessary. And I, I don't want to just make an unnecessary mess inside the engine. Right, well, also, why introduce something that could affect its performance, right? Yeah, it's not too likely because this is a sealed motor, but still... So are, are we happy with the results? It looks pretty it good looks, from here. Yeah, it looks pretty good on this side too. So uh, yeah, I think it's fine. So I have some of that same black paint on a brush. The, the same black paint that I use for the chassis. The flat engine or whatever. Engine black flat, they call it. Um, and I'm going to brush paint this metal part on the sides of each truck. This isn't the greatest paint job, but again, you barely see this. Mostly it's to prevent the metal from showing through. All right, now I have some Model Master Railroad Tie Brown on the brush, and I'm going to paint the wheel faces. Now, you've used other colors for that too, right? Yeah, you could use any really earth tone color for this, or even a dark gray if you wanted. I just generally use Railroad Tie Brown as a color. It's yeah. kind of a nondescript dirt color. Yeah, and the point here really is that the faces of wheels are never shiny, at least. Right. Not uh, on although, trains. No, there is one. I've seen on the Caltrain Bombardier cars, those oh, are shiny. They have those, yeah, they have those disc brakes. That's what's yeah. shiny. And those are only shiny because they get used all the time. Yeah. But I've never seen a freight train that had shiny wheels. That would just look dumb. Yeah, no, that, that doesn't happen. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the one good thing too is since the Atherin trucks don't pick up electricity from the outside of the wheels. Um, you don't have to worry if you get some paint on the tip of the axle. While these are still easy to get to, I'm going to use a little powder on the wheel faces now. This is a dark earth colored powder. So you're basically just going to detail or weather the, the wheel faces while it's a, still apart? Yeah, because it's easy to get to now. Yeah. There's nothing in the way. Yeah, because so. once you put those side frames on, it's real hard to get to that, isn't it? Right. So I'm just using a micro brush and just very gently smearing it around. So I like to build up weathering in layers. So now I've switched and I'm using some dark rust colored powder. Right. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about this more later when you're doing the weathering on the locomotive shell itself, how weathering doesn't happen all at once. So why would you weather it all in one, one fell swoop, right? Right. I think doing it in layers kind of mimics the processes that create weathering on the real thing. So what color is this again? This is a dark rust color. It's kind of a burnt sienna or something like that. Now I'm going to use my Dremel with a wire brush attachment just to make sure that there's no paint or powder on the wheel treads. And the reason for doing this is because you don't want it to affect the electrical pickup from the tread. Right. And I'm, I'm angling the, the brush outward so that I don't take any paint off the wheel. Also, if you notice, this also helps get rid of that sort of yellow color on the wheels and it makes them more silvery. Mm -hmm. I have the side frames here, and or one of them. And if you remember way back when, when we started this whole mess. Over a year ago. Yeah. I scratched letters into the back of each one so I'd know which which one was which. Yes, I do remember that. So this is engineer front EF. That's what the EF means. And this <laughs> is the in this is the front truck and I know that because the red wire is on the right. Mhm. Mm Cuz it goes this way. And that's the engineer's side. So we can go ahead and put this on just yeah. put it in the holes. The point is make sure you put them on the right. <laughs> 
place or else it's going to look funny. Right. And this one is the fireman front. So that would say FF. And now the truck's together. Same thing for the rear truck. This is the engineer rear or ER, which doesn't mean emergency room in this case. <laughs> I'm looking for George Clooney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and fireman rear. I kind of look like George Clooney. I'm good looking like that. I noticed you just aren't saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, there's really no reason not to go ahead and put the chassis back on the trucks. So I'm going to just thread the wires through like that. So slowly uh, being reassembled here. Yeah. And this should fit in like this. See, but now I know there's more painting to be done because you haven't painted the shell yet. Right. Well, you know, it's a process, but I thought, well, let's put it this way. I like doing this because it makes me feel like I'm getting closer to being done. Well, it is progress. Yeah. When I when I can put the chassis together, it feels like, you know. It's home stretch, Dan. Right. What's really cool, though, is that somebody who's just found this playlist could watch the whole process in just a matter of probably a couple hours. Yeah. Or, or a few hours, yeah. right? The magic of TV. Okay, so I'm going to do a little brush painting on the cab interior, too. Now, again, I really don't have any information about how this is really supposed to look. So this is kind of guesswork on my part. But again, it's inside, and you're really not going to see it that much anyhow. Yeah, inside, in the dark, in an unlit cab. Right. So since I have railroad tie brown, I'm going to go ahead and use that as the color for the seat cushions. Right. Because it would be, it probably would be brownish. Yeah, I figure it's probably leather or something like that. It might be black. It could be black vinyl, but this will work. Okay, so what I'm doing here isn't 100% accurate. I um, actually did an internet search for EMD control stands, and I'm just going to pick out some of the details with some black. Yeah, that is so small. I'm surprised you're even taking the time to do this. Yeah, and, and you know... Plus, this, it's going to be in the dark, right, inside the cab? I mean... Yeah. Okay, so I think that's as much as I'm going to do with this, because, like we've been saying, it's going to be inside the cab and really hard to see anyway. Mostly it's just something that'll show up in there if someone looks through the windows. Yep. So, and that's probably a good place to end this chapter. Um, obviously, there's still more painting to do. Yeah, you didn't even paint the shell yet. No, I haven't even got to the yellow and the blue, which is the main thing. But got some of this done. I got a, Everything's primed at this point. The chassis is reassembled. I got the interior done. And so that'll be a good point to continue from next time. Okay, so we'll continue with painting, I guess. Yeah. See you next time. Bye.